So I start with Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you in the name of Allah, the most compassionate and the most merciful. I'd like to start my talk by um, telling you a little bit about the scholarship of recent years on Islam, women, and gender. Uh, this scholarship has been increasingly conducted in the last two decades by women who are Muslim or of Muslim background, uh, like me. This has made it possible uh, for Muslim women academics to refocus, expand, and transform Islamic studies, sometimes against the will of many who do uh, conventional Islamic studies. Uh, However, they have to challenge, these Muslim women academics and scholars have had to challenge the denigration of their scholarship in academia uh, as advocacy. So they are accused of being advocates of a confessional uh, agenda or as too liberal and too feminist uh, when they uh, are speaking in traditional circles. But despite these challenges, uh, there is a kind of wide recognition that there needs to be more inclusive models of knowledge production for women to participate in and for Muslim women to participate in the production of knowledge about Islam uh, or Islamic knowledge uh, that is uh, more theologically oriented. In the slides that I, uh, I have for you, I'd like to explore the fruits of some of these recent studies. So one of the interesting things that uh, have come out of uh, scholarship on gender, women, and Islam is an exploration of what women contributed to Islamic knowledge in the past. Uh, and these are some of the recent books that some of you might be familiar with. Al-Muhadithat by Akram Nadwi, uh, Knowledge in Islam, uh, Women and Knowledge in Islam uh, by Asma Saeed, uh, Women in Islamic Biographical Collections uh, by Ruth Wadod. Uh, and these studies tell us about women's role in the transmission and construction of the Islamic tradition. Al-Muhadithat by Akram Nadwi, for example, uh, gives us uh, an overview, a survey of the thousands of women, including the wives of the Prophet, who helped and contributed to uh, creating uh, the prophetic canon. Uh, so, for example, Aisha, wife of the Prophet, uh, produced or transmitted 2,210 uh, hadiths. And she didn't just transmit some of these transmissions are her own interpretation of prophetic practice of, or life of, with the prophet or uh, Quranic references. Uh, she also contested some of the male interpretations. And that continues uh, down uh, the, uh, the, uh, the years and the centuries. Uh, by the uh, fifth century, we have uh, a scholar called Shuhd al-Katiba, uh, about whom there is a chapter in one of the three books that, that I introduced uh, at the beginning. Shuhd al-Katiba was a calligrapher uh, and a Hadith scholar who taught until the age of 90 in the mosque of Baghdad in, uh, in the 6th century of Islam and the 11th century of the Common Era. Uh, here she's portrayed uh, as sitting on the pulpit in the mosque in a famous literary work uh, produced in the following century. Uh, there's, in the 16th century, Aisha al Ba'uniya, whose book hasn't been studied yet, but has been authored uh, and edited. Um, it's called uh, The Principles of Sufism, where she presents a whole theology of love based on her understanding and reception of uh, the, the various Islamic traditions. Uh, there is Sara, a lesser known scholar, uh, Sara bin Ta'ali ibn Abdul Kafi al Subki, uh, a 15th century scholar who is uh, both a transmitter of prophetic tradition and a jurist in her own right, who has, according to this manuscript, signed a religious ruling or a, a, a juristic ruling in her own name. So the point I'm trying to make is that women across the centuries contributed to the production of Islamic knowledge. And women's 
a role in academia today in the study of gender, women, and Islam has also been about revealing that aspect of Islamic history and presenting a model forward to change scholarship on Islam to take account to become cognizant <coughs> of the role of women. And this can be grounded in theological works which permitted women to engage in theology and scriptural interpretation. For example, Al-Khatib al-Baghdadi, an 11th century Iraqi scholar, talks about the importance of uh, permitting women to do fiqh. Fiqh is Islamic jurisprudence, that there is no obstacle to them engaging in this uh, Islamic discipline. Uh, but the quote that I uh, personally uh, have uh, a soft spot for and I try to include in many of my talks because I think it's worth reflection upon is by the uh, Egyptian uh, and Shafi'i Syrian uh, uh, scholar and Nawawi uh, from Damascus. Uh, he wrote a book on the rules of producing religious rulings in which he actually argued that, uh, provided that the religious scholar or the jurist has acquired all these conditions, for example, uh, that they, ha they are an adult Muslim, uh, that that adult Muslim is trustworthy, pure from corruption or moral faults, who possesses a, a perceptive mind, exact in action, accurate in reasoning, and generally attentive. It does not matter if that person is free, a slave, woman, or a blind person. And the jurist who acquires all these conditions can actually become an independent jurist, somebody who does not belong to a school of thought. So if they have reached that level of knowledge, they can actually establish their own school of thought. So that gate is there in the Islamic tradition for women. And yet we see such silence. And we have women who transmitted the prophetic tradition, some writings by some women theologians, but the contribution is so small in comparison with the possibilities. And we see today contemporary shifts. So for example, many women now are doing Islamic studies in the traditional way. Colleges have sprung up across the Muslim world and in minority contexts where women are studying the traditional disciplines. And as they do this, uh, they are partaking in traditional structures of knowledge, but also contributing to pushing the boundaries to some extent. Uh, we have seen a revival of Islamic education in general, uh, but I could say that some of the colleges I have seen which are mixed, the majority have been women, including colleges in London which uh, are specialized in Islamic education. This is an image not from uh, the, uh, the mosque in Manchester where I, where I live. Uh, this is an image of Al-Azhar which is a major Sunni university in Cairo. And I was just passing by and uh, with no intention to do any research on gender, but forever the academic, I wanted to catch this moment of women studying and teaching in the whole of the mosque of Al-Azhar with their te male teachers and female teachers mixing with the men. That image is very inspiring. And yet, the question that I ask, and this is inspired both through my work and through questions that my daughter asked me when she was four and five and six and seven. So, if women are now partaking in Islamic knowledge, we know that they partook in Islamic knowledge in the past, but the impact is difficult to map out, whether it's the literary legacy of the women or the impact on the ideas. What about women today? How can we push the boundaries of Islamic knowledge? Whether we are Muslim or non-Muslim, working in academia or in confessional educational context, what more can we do? And the reason I've asked this question is obvious, I'm a Muslim woman myself, but one day my daughter Maryam came to me back from the Islamic Arabic school and said, 
You know, today, I felt so embarrassed because you lied to me. And I said, how did I lie to you? <laughs> I don't think I'd lie to you. Uh, and she said, well, my teacher, her female teacher, asked her if uh, she knows any prophets of Islam. And she said, Maryam. And the teacher told her there are no female prophets in Islam. And I've always known that there are debates about female prophets in Islam. And I've told my daughter that Mary, mother of Jesus, is perceived as a female prophetess. So when she took that knowledge to her Islamic Arabic school, that knowledge was undermined as completely outside Islamic doctrine, as incorrect. So I've started doing more research over the years, trying to write a book about debates on female prophethood in Islam. So while this might come across as a bit textual, uh, something of an intellectual history, um, maybe convoluted arguments amongst theologians in some bygone days, but these ideas, this history actually impacts lives and uh, prevents uh, many from remodeling themselves or remodeling their spirituality and morality in ways that uh, are more open than the existing models. So dedicated to my daughter, I start this case study on female prophethood, trying to trace the debate and whether actually we can say that there is a consensus women can't be prophets. And why that is important, because prophecy is a form of agency that has been given to men in Islam and other Abrahamic traditions. It's a kind of divine election. If women were excluded from that, that is actually a serious uh, issue to contend with as believing women. So to start with, the conventional Muslim conception that my daughter confronted uh, is that prophethood uh, in Islam is conditional upon maleness. A representative, uh, a representative articulation of this view can be found uh, in, um, in a treatise by a Persian uh, scholar from the 14th century called Al-Nasafi. Um, by the way, I've made a list of the, the, uh, some of the scholars I'll mention so that you can follow the names. Uh, this is in order of their appearance. I might not mention all of them uh, if, the time, uh, uh, if there are time constraints. Uh, so they are not in chronological order. So al Nasafi, the first one, Abu al-Barakat al Nasafi, a Persian scholar, uh, he, uh, he argues that uh, there aren't any women prophets because prophethood is, conditioned, uh, uh, is conditional upon maleness. In the opening paragraph of his discussion on the characteristics of prophethood, he instructs the reader to know that the prophet must be male. For anybody who knows Arabic, he says, dhakaran. al Nasafi explains this precondition on grounds of the public nature of prophetic responsibility such as uh, promulgation of a call to belief in God and the proclamation of proof, uh, such as a miracle, something to prove the prophecy. He then purports that femaleness is incongruent with that. And he says it's incongruent with that based on the Quran, uh, where uh, it says in chapter 33, Sur uh, Surat al-Ahzab, or the chapter of the clans, Verse 33, remain in your houses, speaking to the wives of the prophet, that is. Remain in your houses and display not your finery as did the pagans of old, and perform the prayer and pay the alms and obey God and his messenger, people of the house God only desires to put away from you, <coughs> abomination, and to cleanse you. Although the whole passage in uh, chapter 33 from verse 28 until verse 33 is addressing the prophet's wives in particular. The verse I read out is extended to all Muslim women as an ideal, as normative. Women should remain at home. So if women should remain at home, how could God send them to have a public role as messengers to people? 
mean, messengerhood can involve divine prophecy, but messengerhood in a very broad sense can involve scholarship as well. And Nasafi's view merits further unpacking. Uh, one of the things, of course, is his reading of the uh, Quranic verse, remain in, in your homes, uh, is only one of the recitations, but he presents it as a consensus. Suffice it to observe that Al-Nasafi presents this as the correct doctrine of the people who follow Prophet Muhammad's tradition. But digging into the Sunni theological tomes doesn't sustain this view. The more I looked, the more I found proof of major disagreements, not only about women prophets, but also about the nature of prophecy and prophethood itself. There are so many conceptions of prophethood, even within the Sunni tradition, even within the same school of the Sunni tradition. Uh, the Sunni tradition is, uh, is the largest denomination in the Muslim world. So there is abundant evidence that before an nasafi the terms of the debate were markedly different. Nobody asked, is gender important for the, uh, uh, for the, um, the case for, for a person to become a prophet? The question was different. So the terms of the debate shifted over time. For example, in early classical systematic theology, the idea of women prophets is often tackled more openly. So the question was uh, not uh, dismissed, and it, was, it often occurred not as a discussion of the characteristics and gender of the prophet, but more uh, in the discussion about how we can prove uh, prophecy. And this was uh, a debate that I can't uh, fully uh, explain today, but it was a debate against the philosophers in particular who didn't see prophecy as important, and who considered human reason enough to uh, discern what is good and what is bad, and to discern uh, the truth in general. Uh, so in key works, looking at one of the renowned key works of systematic theology, the opposition to female prophecy doesn't turn on gender at all. Scholars such as al juwaini is number two, from two who, who represents a major uh, classical theological school called uh, Al-Asha'ira, uh, his argument relies on historical silence. So he doesn't make gender a condition of prophecy. Rather, he says, we don't know of any woman who proclaimed herself to be a prophet. So even women who had miracles. And we have Mary, mother of Jesus, or Maryam, uh, who uh, is associated with miracles in the Quran. But does she anywhere in the Quran say that these miracles are proof of her prophecy? In that case, al Juwaini says, well, she was silent, so we can't consider her a female prophet. So the exclusion from prophecy is not a denial that women could be miracle workers. He accepts that Ma Mary, Maryam, is a miracle worker. Rather, it turns on the distinction between prophetic and saintly miracles. Since she didn't call herself a prophet, then this must be uh, a manifestation of her saintliness or special status. And a further proof is the people of the cave who are mentioned in the Quran as having manifested a miracle, uh, but that was never associated with uh, a claim that they were prophets. So in a way, this leaves us, this classical position leaves us with the, uh, with the possibility that unbeknownst to us, there may have been women prophets that the Quran has not mentioned. There may have been women prophets who proclaimed miracles as proof of their prophecy, but the Quran hasn't mentioned them. The Quran itself says that it, do, it doesn't tell the stories of all prophets. The reason for this more open position in classical theology comes from the very conception of prophecy as uh, turning on miracles. 
miracle or the miracle has to be uh, there has to be a miracle and the miracle has to be a proof of prophecy uh, and the ideal representation of this is prophet Jesus and uh, prophet Moses and uh, unique and marvelous miracles like those of Maryam do exist uh, but if the miracle hasn't been announced as proof of the prophecy then it can't be taken as such uh, and there are many scholars who accepted that view across the schools of thought, the rationalists and the traditionists. They were so concerned with the proof being proclaimed. So did anybody diverge from that wide uh, view uh, of uh, prophethood and miracles in early Islam, which is not intended to exclude women as that later articulation I mentioned, but rather uh, the exclusion of women from prophecy is a byproduct of the nature of the argument and also is not uh, uh, categorical in, uh, in denying that women could have been miracles, uh, could have been prophets. Are there scholars who diverge? Yes. And scholars who diverge from these essentializations uh, take a different approach anchored in the Quran. So rather than adopting systematic theology, they develop a hermeneutics based in, on the Qur'an's language. So instead of reading an external, already formulated idea about prophethood and then finding evidence from the Qur'an, they start from the Qur'an's understanding of prophecy and the language surrounding prophecy, uh, which one might call the conceptual grammar of Islam, of the Qur'an. One of these scholars is Ibn Hazm, he's number four. As the Mahshari, just to, uh, to say why he's here, because he represents the rationalist school, uh, the Mu'tazili school, for those who know the history of Islamic theology, who also agreed with al juwaini about what constitutes prophecy and why women are to be excluded. So Ibn Hazm is an Andalusian scholar who belonged to a, a school uh, that took the Qur'an and prophetic tradition seriously and developed a theology that is grounded in a hermeneutics of the text. So Ibn Hazm starts from arguing that the lack of evidence, the lack of historical evidence, cannot be taken to represent a, a view on female prophethood. And he writes a treatise called The Prophethood of Women, which is one of the very few expositions dedicated entirely to the question at hand. Uh, he argues uh, that there are key uh, terms and uh, occurrences in the Quran that actually go against that uh, consensus that there were no women that we know of who were prophets. He argues, for example, that the Qur'an mentions a dialogue, recounts a dialogue, between Abraham's wife, Sarah, and the angels in chapter 11, Surah Hud, in which she is given news of Isaac and Jacob. So Abraham's wife is talking to the angels. She is not simply a privilege of being a prophet's wife, as he will, as he will say and argue. He also mentions that the mother of Joseph, uh, Moses was divinely instructed in chapter 28, Surah Al-Qasas, to cast her son into the water. And more clearly, on another occasion, uh, in Surah Taha, chapter 20, uh, verse 38, to, uh, uh, she's, she's cast as having received revelation to cast her son into the water. So the word revelation is associated with her. Ibn Hazm considers this clear evidence that she received divine revelation. Which mother would cast her child into the water without certainty that they will be saved? And certainty cannot be achieved without revelation. Like Moses' mother and Abraham's wife, Maryam is given news about her purification and election by the angels, and then she's visited by angel Gabriel to be given glad tidings of Jesus. Employing all these Quranic citations as attesting these women's prophethood, uh, Ibn Hazm says that the whole point 
of the word for prophethood in Arabic, nubuwa, which comes from naba'a, is to receive news, is to have news communicated. So fundamentally, lexically, prophethood in Arabic means receiving news, divine news or revelation. And unlike the Persian scholars I've talked about so far, who all lived in the eastern part of the Muslim world and who conceptualized prophethood in missionary terms, uh, prophethood as persuading, converting, and publicly uh, proclaiming miracles, for Ibn Hazm, the most uh, important component of prophethood is prophecy. Not doing all these public roles, but prophecy itself. And the objections against Mary and Mary's prophethood uh, that, for example, she doesn't proclaim herself a prophet, uh, not just Ibn Hazm, but even other uh, uh, scholars such as the uh, 14th century Damascene scholar Ibn Taymiyyah, his name is not here, I wasn't planning to mention him, they say this idea, it comes from outside the Qur'an. There's no evidence in the Qur'an that somebody needs to say, I bring forth a miracle and this is proof of my prophethood. And that's a convoluted theological uh, argument. Rather, the Qur'an talks of revelation. So Ibn Hazm says that those who object to Mary as uh, being uh, a female prophet uh, have no grounds, have no Qur'anic grounds. And those who say that, in fact, the Qur'an designates her as a person of truth, an Arabic word, siddiqa, uh, that this doesn't exclude her, her from being a female prophet because um, Joseph, in chapter 12 of the Qur'an, who is a prophet, clearly designated as a prophet, is also described with the same term. If anything, Prophethood and being a person of truth are intertwined. The Quran says about Mary um, or about Jesus, uh, the Messiah, son of Mary, was only a messenger. Messengers before him passed away. His mother was a woman of truth. They both ate food. So Ibn Hazm finds attestation in the Quran many times that being uh, a person of truth uh, is actually a station of excellence in the eyes of God that is concomitant to prophethood. And that being a person of truth indicates moral and spiritual perfection, which is a prerequisite of prophethood and has been achieved by Maryam, and not only Maryam, in, according to the Qur'an, the Pharaoh's wife has also achieved perfection. And if we go by the prophetic tradition, there is Khadija, the first wife of the Prophet. Another Andalusian scholar who belonged to the mainstream school of al juwaini agreed with Ibn Hazm that going by Qur'anic evidence, all the terms surrounding Maryam, echo the status of prophethood, purification, election, being a person of truth, being purified, being given miracles. Uh, all of these terms uh, and, uh, let's say, concepts of prophethood occur surrounding Mary in, with such an intensity that Al-Qurtubi, he was a Cordoban exegete uh, from the seventh century, cannot deny what the Quran is saying about uh, Maryam as a female prophet. In fact, uh, he uh, says toward the end of his exposition of uh, verse 42, chapter 3 of the Quran, Surah Al Imran, he says, uh, Maryam to women is like Muhammad to men. So in her prophethood, she is to women what Prophet Muhammad is to men. So this parallel is quite powerful. To think of a woman capable of being compared to Prophet Muhammad uh, in, in, in this way. The point often made when I speak of Ibn Hazm and Al-Qurtubi is that they were actually atypical or exceptional. 
that their ideas was born out of a, uh, of a theology that was progressive because <coughs> medieval Muslim society in Cordoba, specifically both of them were from Cordoba, was a bit lax. After all, Cordoba is often characterized by having had greater freedoms for women at the time uh, than elsewhere in the Muslim world. And Ibn Hazm was a contemporary of the famous Andalusian princess Walada. Does anybody know Walada here? No? So Walada was a daughter of an Umayyad caliph, so toward the end of the golden period of uh, Muslim Spain uh, in the early fourth century. Uh, her uh, romantic escapades are well known in the historical accounts. She was a poetess herself, uh, and uh, she even inscribed on her gown uh, the poetic lines, I am by God fit for high positions. Highest positions she imagined to be uh, hers to take. And I walk on my way with great pride and offer my cheek to whomever desires to kiss it. So this was considered scandalous even in Cordoba, but it also indicates, and it wasn't just Walada who was a, a female poetess, but it also indicates that women saw themselves as able to aspire to the highest position and to freely ex express themselves. But I want to, perhaps toward the end of my talk, uh, to draw attention to a much earlier scholar. Because Ibn Hazm wasn't influenced by the progressive Cordoban uh, society and uh, the, uh, let's say, the prominent agency of women in cultural life in Muslim Spain. If we go back to the uh, third century of Islam, which would be the ninth century of the Common Era, we have Abu Uthman al-Jahid, a polymath from al-Basra, Iraq, a rationalist scholar like al-Zamakhshari from the Mu'tazilite school. Uh, his legacy covers all Islamic disciplines. In fact, we can say that he can be credited with bringing forth the idea of the miracle as proof of prophecy. He has written one of the earliest treaties on proofs of prophethood to argue against Christian theologians and rationalist philosophers who denied prophecy that Prophet Muhammad's miracles are evident uh, and he coined the term burhan, proof. Why do I mention al-Jahiz? It's like I've gone to Cordoba and uh, I've mentioned a Nasafi in, uh, in the 14th century. Why am I going back to the 9th century? Because I want to draw your attention to the fact that the whole debate about uh, women's prophethood and the place of women in Islamic cosmology, as it were, or in Islamic understanding of the relationship between humanity and the divine, uh, is ongoing and can be traced back to those early roots. And Maryam's uniqueness and the appeal of Maryam as a figure that uh, represents this connection with the divine, that role, that uh, unique role she was given by the divine, that this goes back to, uh, to the let's say, to the ground of Islamic intellectual life, whether it was theological or literary or uh, hermeneutic, uh, especially in connection with the Quran. So al-Jahid doesn't say that Maryam is a prophet of, go of God. But he writes in a book, uh, in a polemic book uh, against Christian theologians, an epistle on women. So in that theological treatise, which is polemical, that engages with Christian theologians trying to prove that Prophet Muhammad uh, is, is a true prophet, he comes up with a, a chapter or an epistle on women. And under that, he includes a section entitled, God created a child from a woman without a male spouse and did not create a child from a man without a female spouse. It's a very long title in Arabic. I've tried my best with the translation. 
Al-Jahid describes this as a marvelous miracle and an outstanding proof, Burhan. So I've taken you back to that old language before Ibn Hazm. Something given to women only. And using the terminology of systematic uh, Muslim theology, he says, or unambiguously references, this to be uh, something so unique to women that it gives them a degree above men. That's not Cordoba. This is Basra in the ninth century. So Al-Jahith cannot be accused of uh, sloppily using the term Burhan since he himself coined it. He wrote one of the early treaties to argue for the Burhan or the proof of Prophet Muhammad's prophethood. When he uses that term to describe Maryam as having a Burhan that marks her uniqueness and that of all women above men in this particular way, that particular way being uh, God's choice of a woman to be given the most marvelous miracle of the virginal conception. Then what he's saying is quite fascinating about how Muslim, early Muslims actually understood or had a, an open horizon as they understood the question of gender and prophecy. Now jumping uh, forward or leaping forward uh, many, many centuries. I would say that these early favorable views, the conflicted opinions, uh, all of these different nuances about what constitutes prophecy was not specific to Andalusia for sure and was never uh, consolidated into any form of consensus either way. But it opened the possibility for even the most conservative scholars, like Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, the last on my list, who is known as the uh, authority on explaining the sound collection of prophetic tradition called al-Bukhari. Uh, Ibn Hajar says, if we understand prophecy or prophethood as uh, turning on prophecy or receiving revelation, then we have a tradition that says for women uh, and, and the receiving revelation and uh, also uh, being conditional upon moral perfection, then we have four women in the prophetic tradition who achieved perfection, Maryam, Asya, the wife of the Pharaoh, and uh, the superiority according to the tradition, the superiority of Aisha to all women is like the, the superiority of Tharid, which is a dish to all dishes. Uh, Ibn Hajar considers it uh, actually plausible based on the prophetic tradition and uh, this understanding of the idea of uh, prophethood as prophecy uh, coming to somebody who has achieved moral perfection. Now, I've taken you on a journey. Maybe I've confused you with all the theological terms. The point that um, I'm trying to make is that one of the salient features of this debate is that scholars from the formative to the early modern period continue to address this question in the various religious disciplines across the multiple genres of writing. And I won't, I have a, a list of another 20, but I thought we don't have the time for that today. I'm writing a book about it. Um, so the salient feature of this debate is that it does not attempt to close down the possibility of women prophets. Even those who are articulating correct doctrine that prophethood is conditional upon maleness, they, in their arguments, in the detail of their arguments, they are trying to contend against all these different views. So in a way, by making those points about or trying to exclude women from uh, the possibility of receiving prophecy uh, by mentioning all the other views, they re-inscribe them in the debate and the debate remains alive. So the final question that I want to leave you with, so what's the point of going back to all this tradition? Why don't we render the slate clean and start afresh? Um, that is because in the reality of religious practice, 
children, women, and many others will come against uh, views that will sound like they are correct and most authoritative and based on consensus. So we need to, in order to challenge these models which are exclusionary, we need to develop not just a new theology, because that's easy to dismiss, but also an understanding of theology that is far more open to, uh, to allowing women and others, or, or women and, and all believers within the community, to develop more inclusive models. So at this point, I think uh, it's time for you to ask questions and maybe you can try to push the boundaries of this theological thought by making suggestions, further suggestions, as to where else you might think I should look, what other topics you think I need to, to be uh, trying to deconstruct. Thank you very much. Really fascinating um, lecture, um, especially going through all these great historical, traditional figures. Um, and I think you... I think these traditional figures, as great as they were, they would have been influenced by the culture of their time, which would have been male-dominated. And maybe that influence, that was the external influence which made them come to that view that they couldn't be female prophets. But as you say, Ibn Hazm countered that by going to the Quran itself and showing that it couldn't be ruled out. And actually, as a suggestion, it reminded me of a lecture I listened to on YouTube recently called female archetypes in the Quran. And it talked about, if we go, may, maybe the best way of countering these historical traditions, traditional view, is acknowledge the strengths in them, but appreciate that they, the weakness in them is that they would have been influenced by their, their culture of their time. But that the Quran is free of these kind of cultural influences. And it actually portrays many women in the Quran in a really positive, strong way. And um, you know, pe people, uh, as you mentioned, that um, uh, the mother of Moses and Maryam and um, even the Queen of Sheba is portrayed in a really positive light, actually. Uh, and actually, the Quran is actually devoid of the negative representation of Eve in the Quran as well. So, um, and I just want to say it is really um, fascinating talk, and thank you for. I just wondered if you thought about um, any other examples in the Quran of, of women in the Quran which could strengthen the argument as well. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's a, an excellent question uh, because I can say a bit more about why I'm doing what I'm doing. I said something toward the end about should we render the slate clean and, and start afresh. I think there has been fantastic scholarship on women in the Quran and, and gender and women in the Quran and different angles to uh, engaging with uh, women uh, figures in the Quran and gendered agencies in the Quran. And I supervised several PhD <coughs> theses on the topic. Um, but the, I guess to, um, to be able to expand and promote a more egalitarian understanding we have to engage with the tradition that so many hold on to. Um, the work of people like Amina Wadud and Asma Ballas and, uh, and many others is, has been inspiring, but it has always been accused of being outside the tradition. Although I would say, given the linguistic engagement, they are actually within the very heart of the tradition, but they don't engage or take on board the dominant views. I find that the politics of knowledge is uh, very sensitive in Islamic contexts. And one of the ways that I think uh, a more productive politics could be is, in my experience, is to say, you can't claim that to be a consensus. Because it was never proclaimed as a consensus uh, across time and in, in various uh, Islamic uh, works of, of renown and authority. And I can point out where, in reality, when I'm faced with that, the view of a consensus or the view of exclusion is just uh, rooted in some, uh, let's say, imagined idea of tradition. 
So in pushing against the imagined idea of tradition, we need to see what the tradition actually says. Yes, they were the products of their own times. That actually strengthens the argument. If they were the products of their own time, in a male patriarchal, male-centered patriarchal context, why didn't they all exclude women in the end from prophecy? Why didn't they biologically indict all women? It would have been much easier. In fact, many of them took the Quran seriously. Many of them could not talk with certitude about women not being female prophets or not being anything. So the, the, the disagreement suggests that, you know, the tradition wasn't just the product of patriarchy, as it were, but there are things that spoke from the Quran to people, and we can get glimpses of that. The reason I say this also uh, is, a, is a personal, uh, let's say, theological stance, uh, and it's a simple one. If the Quran was never understood until modernity, so if the idea of gender equality is Quranic, and that has never been understood at all, and it's such an important principle, then that says something about the Quran and not just its interpreters. So I would like to think that no generation of interpreters manages to embrace or capture the full meaning of the Quran. But certainly glimpses of fundamental principles must be present in the, uh, in the various receptions of the Quran, whether it's Quran exegesis or uh, Kalam, which is systematic theology or any other discipline. I hope that you don't mind the long-winded answer. I saw Humaira has raised her yeah. hand that I don't know who. Yeah. Sorry, just wait for the mic one second. Does that answer your question? Lovely to listen to you after a very long time. Um, of course, it's lovely to hear your overview of the different arguments about women and prophethood. But the question that I have on my mind for, since I can remember, is something went wrong very early, right? And very early on, I mean, I know there are some scholars who say we've actually never had Islam because Islam was never really implemented properly after the rightly guided khalifs and everything. So it opens, if you take that line, therefore, if we never really had Islam implemented properly, then what is it that we're living and what is it that we should be living? So there's a big... Or could have. Or what could, yeah. <laughs> so therefore, that, that this is a question I'm exploring myself at the moment. But the question I have on the issue of gender, which is something I've been involved in myself for a long time, is I've got to the point, I've done all the angry and all the this and that and all that, <laughs> I've done that, I've overcome I'm sure that. it comes back. Sometimes. Yeah, it comes back periodically. <laughs> there are some red flags here and there. Uh, but the question I have is that... Um, we spend a lot of our time sort of being defensive against male exclusivism, uh, exclusivism which is right. I'm not saying that as a negative, negative thing, uh, but they've put us in a position where we're constantly having to prove ourselves. And to be honest, I'm tired of having to prove ourselves because it's there, it's clear, you've given the arguments for it. We don't have to keep uh, proving it. But the other question that I have is, if we were to Im have implemented what I certainly feel is more what the Quranic and prophetic message is. What would that look like? I don't think it looks like what we have today, right? Um, and I think what, what role uh, do women have? Because I think that women are trying so hard to compete with men, to have this kind of equality in the image of men, but we're losing what it is that actually women bring to the table. And you mentioned these potential prophetic uh, figures so what did they bring to the table? Were they the same as men? Were they different? And if there was a conversation <coughs> happened between men and women of equal participation in a theological, spiritual sense, what does that look like? What would that be like? How would we be living if that was actually happening? There's so many questions. <laughs> and delivered so eloquently, I, I was hypnotized. Exactly. What, what, what the, yeah. Um, how would it look like if we live according to... Um... Female Imam? <laughs> Not really, you've got many of them do just as many crazy things. I have no expectations there necessarily, unless they fulfill the criteria that you're giving and contribute something new. Um, I think I'll take you to the image from Al-Azhar. This, uh, this was taken last summer 
I should have added an image from Ramadan. I spent Ramadan, Ramadan in Cairo, and I went for the nightly prayers. And again, the, uh, the main hall of Al-Azhar was full of women. Um, I think we, yeah, and that's probably something I'm also um, guilty of. We put too much emphasis on the text and the intellectual life of the Islamic tradition and less <coughs> emphasis on the practice. And we have very little historical knowledge of how Muslims <coughs> practice and what women contributed to uh, faith and, and a life of faith and, and spirituali everyday spirituality. I can't uh, reconstruct that uh, just off of the top of my head, but I can reconstruct my experiences of Muslim women's spirituality today, especially with uh, increasing levels of knowledge and engagement with the text. That's unprecedented. The number of women reading and uh, studying Islamic text is, is increasing exponentially all over the world. Uh, I'm not saying that this necessarily leads to more, in, in, let's say, more uh, inclusive models, but it, it will certainly have some impact on the emerging questions on the different types of practices. So one thing that I felt uh, during those prayers in between, there were, I met many women who had degrees in Islamic theology, who were commenting and correcting uh, the, uh, the way the Imam recited the Quran and explaining the recitations and sharing knowledge and moving amongst the men and actually, uh, some of them were teachers of the men who were at the prayers in other contexts uh, and were giving them instructions. I feel that these models of practice, this is within an educational, let's say, within uh, a scholarly milieu. But after I, I left those nightly prayers, I just went around in the, the square uh, in Old Cairo, where there were many women sat around the, uh, the uh, shrines of members uh, of the Prophet's family. And they too had their vivid spirituality, which has completely constructed the landscape or the public square uh, in a way that uh, gives them cent uh, central place. Uh, and they were talking about their visions, their dreams, their understanding of the world, how they support each other materially, socially, etc. I think we've reduced uh, what women have contributed and can contribute to a set of ideas and a set of texts and a set of interpretations. So that's one thing that I'm grappling with because in the end I'm an academic and I'm trying to work within the parameters of academia, but there's so much more to uh, life in faith that women contribute uh, in, in, real, uh, in real life and, and actually change the world around them, including men. But tracing that, we need both ethnographers and theologians. That's really very interesting. And, um, and similarly, I've seen some things online about this. I'm no expert at all. But one thing I did feel um, that it's worth saying is that it, uh, very often we're blind to the lens that we're being asked these questions or these issues are being raised. And if, if the lens that we're looking at Islamic scholarship and the place of women in prophecy is through a Western lens. I think that so much can be so distorted and, and misunderstood because um, if there were 124,000 prophets or however many there were, uh, um, and as you say, some tr tremendous women um, in Islam, then, then there's a, I think there must be some, something much more fluid than firm definitions or even the need to extract anything too precise because there is nobility and greatness in all people, men and women. And what I wonder, um, I hear about lectures I've talk, listened to about women that were teaching, and this goes to your point about what maybe the expansion of the notion of women, not just in terms of prophecy, but in terms of uh, nobility and greatness and um, uh, women of light, basically. So the, the, the women that were known to be teachers of the great men that ultimately came to um, be known, and they would go to, the, to sit at the feet of these women to, to learn about Islam. So I think that the, there, there perhaps is too much rigidity to just looking at prophecy, because prophecy is something that is it's a, it's a gift from 
Allah that is completely out of anyone's control or, you know, and, and to over-define, I think, might actually be damaging to the notion of, as you're referring to, the truly spiritual great women. And, and maybe that, that definition can be expanded a little. But I also wanted to just ask you, what were the four women that, that were highly regarded? It was Maryam, Maryam and, um, and uh, Asiya. Um, Moses' his mother. And, um, and Khadija or Khadija. Aisha, depending yeah, those on... Those are the four this, that are yeah, well known. This is from the Sunni hadith tradition. Um, <coughs> maybe I should have mentioned that uh, the issue of prophecy is not outside, uh, let's say, doctrines which govern uh, the social relations uh, within Muslim society. So you will find often in explanations of males' guardianship over women as predicated on uh, men having a higher degree of women and the evidence of, uh, of male superiority is that God chose them to be his prophets rather than women. So it's not like a topic that's no longer relevant because prophecy was sealed and, you know, uh, now we can just talk about women who are friends of God, uh, awliya or saints or uh, that we're kind of projecting let's say, a, uh, a scholarly, a Western scholarly agenda on Islamic theology. It's at the heart of the various structures which see women in asymmetrical relations to men. And yeah, I mean, it, it, it comes up in so many contexts as the evidence for male superiority. So you can't escape from tackling that, you know, uh, that question. Also, I've been asked that quite often, you know, am I not bringing, let's say, a feminist or a, an analytical uh, uh, question uh, that comes from gender theory and kind of, you know, imposes an episteme or a framework of knowledge on Islamic tradition and diverts us from the real question is how do we achieve, you know, uh, a degree of, of spirituality and greatness, etc. Uh, I would say given the, uh, you know, the, uh, the range of engagement, it's not a modern question. It has been uh, a question that we see across time, across place. They were concerned with that question. Uh, should we ignore it and say, okay, if we bring it up today, then we're kind of you know, inscribing uh, the Islamic tradition within a feminist liberal agenda. I think, yeah, I mean, a nuanced position for me is one that does not succumb to the binary of you either accept what there is or reject, reject it and adopt a different agenda from outside it. So neither, you know, uh, neither liberal feminism nor traditionalism uh, are, for me, a way forward, because I think we need to keep asking a critical question about the two horizons coming together. How do we bring them together? What do we get out of that? When do we create boundaries? When do we have a productive uh, reflection on, on what the tradition might be saying, or what fe liberal feminism or gender theory might be saying? Some of my work is actually a critique of gender theory and its limits, because it does not, and it will not consider the metaphysical. It will. It's really, really important for my work, and needs to be done. I just think that the fear, as I said, I'm not going to have to say, I'm 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 going to have to uh, about, you know, like white people effectively. And she sort of said, well, I am writing the problem in my context. So I always, I always go back to that because I think that sometimes the, the lens can be so, so good. Um, and the questions that, that are asked have to be from a lens that isn't just sitting in modern Western, you know, modern men, modern Western mindset. But as you say, there's so much historical. Yeah. And the fusion of these horizons. Uh, or the bringing of these uh, inquiries together uh, and also projecting back the critical lens onto gender theory. As I said, 
Um, much of gender theory that I read, that I try to use, is problematic because uh, there's no space for understanding uh, a metaphysics of gender that is not you know, accepting that everything is political and everything is secular. So, yeah, there, is, there isn't a non-secular gender theory, as it were. So that constrains me, and constrains me, and that's a problem. So I try to write and engage uh, in a critique. Some might call it decolonial critique. Uh, and we're one of the things that I hope to, to do in this uh, book, inshallah, uh, is to try to find whether one could develop an episteme that is contextualized, of course, but that draws on the Islamic tradition, but doesn't necessarily uh, repeat uh, the views, but uses the concepts in helpful ways. So we don't need to repeat the views of all these scholars, but can we get something from them that is perhaps more uh, appropriate to our context and push gender theory beyond its limits? I'm sure we've got a lot more questions for Dr. Nagib, but that is all the time we've got this today. Um, thank you again, Dr. Nagib.